to welcome you all to our Tyro session this morning, which is really absolutely a spectacular lineup to discuss some very challenging uh, pediatric thyroid cases that uh, we have put together here. Um, and for all our tumor boards, it's a pleasure to introduce Dr. Mike Tuttle, um, who will be uh, running the show this morning uh, and, and helping to introduce all of our outstanding international panelists. Fantastic. Thanks, Mark. Um, we do have uh, two or maybe three uh, really challenging cases. The first one is particularly challenging, and uh, we'll have our, our colleagues that are working with the team uh, that are taking care of this young kid in Spain uh, participating and listening in. So uh, a good chance to help colleagues from around the world. Um, what I'll do is I'll just go around here. Let me have uh, everybody just in one or two sentences introduce themselves so that everybody knows who we are. Dr. Langer, let's start with you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jill Langer. I'm a radiologist at the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, I'm the co-director of the thyroid nodule clinic there. Awesome. Dr. Thomas. Hi there. Thank you very much for having me join this evening. Uh, morning for you. Um, I'm from Perth, Western Australia. Perth is uh, the largest city in Western Australia, which is one of the large states in Australia, population around 2.6 million. I'm a nuclear medicine specialist. I work across both pediatrics and adult, but have a pediatrics background with a special interest in thyroid cancer. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks, Liz. Dr. Francis. Hi, I'm Gary Francis. I'm at the uh, University of Texas Health Science Center, San Antonio. Uh, I am a member of the Mays Cancer Center here and um, the Adolescent and Young Adult uh, Cancer Center, and uh, primarily work with kids with thyroid cancer. Awesome. Thanks, Gary. Dr. Wagaspeck. Good morning, everyone, and good evening, Liz. Um, my name is Stephen Wagaspeck, and I am an oncologic endocrinologist who takes care of adults and children with thyroid cancer at the uh, University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. Perfect. Dr. Chen. Yeah. Hi, this is Dr. Chen. I'm a cytopathologist. I have my private practice at Family Medical Diagnostic in New York, New York City. So I see patient, uh, example, you ultrasound, do a biopsy procedure, and also do on-site cytological evaluation and cytological diagnosis. Perfect. Dr. Bauer. I'm Andy Bauer. I'm a pediatric endocrinologist and director of the Thyroid Center at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Perfect. Dr. Pittman. Hi, I'm a laryngologist, and I'm the chief uh, of laryngology and the Center for Voice and Swallowing at Columbia University Medical Center. And we take care of uh, both kids and adults with voice issues. Fantastic. Thanks for joining, Mike. Uh, Dr. Camilo Gonzalez Vasquez. Camilo. Hi, everyone. Um, I am an associate professor in endocrinology in the Universidad Autónoma de Nuevo León in Monterrey, Mexico. I am the co director of the Thyroid Nodule Clinic here. I'm happy to see you all. Fantastic. And lastly, Dr. Brandwine, introduce yourself for us, young lady. Hi, Margie Brandwine Weber. Um, I'm professor of pathology and a section um, and a site chief of pathology at Mount Sinai West. Awesome, fantastic. Thanks for joining. Uh, Dr. Erkin, uh, let's go ahead and get started with your case here. Terrific. Uh, Mike, are we up? Is it nine o'clock now or? Um... <laughs> it's, it's almost, we're almost done. Go. Okay. <laughs> All right, terrific. Uh, we'll welcome everybody, and I want to um, start off by thanking all of our panelists. I think this is the largest panel that we've had for any of our international um, thyroid tumor boards. Uh, so thank you um, uh, for joining us. Uh, this is, um, and I also want to welcome uh, the group from Spain who have been taking care of this um, uh, young man. Uh, so I, and uh, we welcome everyone as always to uh, send in questions or comments into the chat section, and we will do everything we can to get to those while we're working through these cases. So um, I just want to preface um, uh, my presentation here that uh, I've pieced together information on this young man from uh, the information that was supplied to me. Uh, from the managing physicians at the Barcelona University Pediatric and Teaching and Research Hospital. Um, and this young man who started his journey at the age of seven had initial surgery back in July 2018. He underwent, um, at that time, total uh, thyroidectomy, central compartment lymph node section, and bilateral lateral neck. And this is the pathology. And I don't want to go through this 
in um, line by line, but other, but really highlight the fact that uh, he had some um, uh, certain features that I think will be important um, in understanding his clinical course and uh, where we are today. Um, this was multifocal um, uh, thyroid cancer with extrathyroidal extension with muscular and adipose tissue involvement. Um, the uh, findings were interpreted as being tumor in contact with both the anterior and posterior um, margins, and there was vascular invasion and two parathyroids identified. There was extensive nodal involvement at that time with multiple lymph nodes demonstrating extra nodal extension. And one important point here is that there was a pretracheal wall biopsy that was uh, interpreted as being infiltration by papillary thyroid cancer uh, without um, uh, evidence of lymphoid tissue. Um, and then uh, multiple lymph nodes from each side of the, of the neck. I thought it would be easiest if I put this timeline together um, and bring us right up to the present. And I had the opportunity to examine this young man um, about a week and a half ago in New York when we got follow-up imaging. But um, these are the, the timing of his surgical procedures um, as it relates to treatment of his um, thyroid cancer. And then these were his therapeutic um, radioiodine treatments dating back uh, to 2018 and the fall of 2019. So let me walk you through his journey. Um, this is uh, the findings on his um, first uh, treatment with 150 millicuries back in November of 2018. Um, and the post-treatment scan demonstrated um, uptake and that was interpreted as intense um, uptake for with th for thyroid remnants. Um, there was no evidence of any mediastinal or lateral compartment or systemic uptake, um, suggesting uh, a residual disease um, present. Um, the patient did suffer a bilateral vocal cord paralysis as well as hypoparathyroidism um, uh, uh, following that initial surgery. And several months later, in February of 2019, he did experience respiratory failure and required intubation and a tracheostomy. Um, the uh, uh, next-gen sequencing was performed and identified a RET-PTC uh, variant, um, as shown here. Uh, and uh, this actually dovetails into our second case this morning. Um, so repeat imaging done uh, was done with a second course of radioiodine. Um, the patient did undergo a diagnostic whole body scan in June of 2009, which demonstrated uptake on both sides of the trachea consistent with central compartment nodal disease. And then there was an additional fo focus of disease that was um, interpreted as retrotracheal um, and uh, right lateral compartment uh, disease. Um, stimulated TG at that time was 42 uh, with no evidence of antibodies. And so they gave a second dose um, of 150 millicuries in September of 2019. And um, the post-treatment scan did show uptake on the left side of the um, central compartment uh, that they interpreted as thyroid remnant and um, no real other evidence of disease uh, that was identified. And so this is um, the thyroglobulin um, that that's, uh, um, gives an idea of where that's been over the course of this young man's journey um, with no real change in thyroglobulin um, as a result of multiple surgeries and as a result of two courses of radioiodine. Um, the time period of 2019 to 2020, there were um, several uh, um, uh, tracheostomy-related problems. And um, just in a, sort of an update uh, from the family that since 2021, he has been uh, quite stable from a clinical perspective. He does participate actively playing soccer and tennis, um, which uh, are very important to him. And this sort of provides a um, understanding of, uh, uh, to inform the, the latter part of our discussion here. Um, he underwent a third cancer resection, July, 2020, 
um, with left paratracheal um, resection that showed soft tissue infiltration by papillary thyroid cancer, um, a fourth surgical procedure in September 2020 with five of 13 positive nodes removed and cancer in the soft tissue. Um, and then a PET-CT was done in March 2021 um, that demonstrated subcentimeter lateral and paratracheal nodal disease. Um, and there were findings in the lung that were felt to be uncharacterizable based on metabolic activity um, due to their size. And, and so, um, uh, and no other findings uh, from a systemic perspective. The patient underwent surgery again in July uh, 2021. This is the, first, the fifth surgical procedure um, and bilateral lateral compartment nodal disease was removed with no evidence of metastases on the right side, but two positive nodes um, uh, removed from the left side. And then uh, we move ahead um, into December, 2021. Um, and uh, a quick note that thyroglobulin was trending um, in the range of 20 to 30. Um, and in 2021, there was a stimulate, thyrogen stimulated PET-CT and I-123 scan uh, that was performed. Um, and it did demonstrate that um, there was an iodine uptake in uh, soft tissue in the left thyroid bed. Um, and um, an activity that coincided with the image of the left anterior pretracheal or paratracheal adenopathy at the level of the sternal notch. There was left lateral compartment uh, nodes identified and the lung parenchyma again on I-123 and on PET um, did a demonstrated these subcentimeter nodules not metabolically characterizable. So the sixth third surgery was performed in March, 2022. Um, and bilateral lymph nodes were removed. The surgeon decided not to go into the central compartment um, and did identify as it anticipated extensive um, scar tissue. And this is the pathology from that 2022 surgery demonstrating 26 lymph nodes removed from the right lateral compartment, all of which were negative. And there were two positive nodes without e, &E removed from the left lateral compartment. And so I'm going to let Margie Bramwine um, jump in here and summarize her findings on review of that pathology. Sure. Good, <clears throat> good morning, everybody. Um, this is the summary of the pathology that I reviewed from the original surgeries in, uh, in surgery in uh, 2018. So um, what he had was diffusely infiltrating uh, PTC with a dominant mass of 2.5 centimeters on the left side. And we see various features, which I'll show you. There's classic, this follicular variant, but also what I'll show you is the solid paraganglioma-like features. Um, there was no tall cell component. And really of note, there was tumor necrosis in the primary tumor, and there was also a tumor necrosis in the metastatic tumor. Um, there was um, multifocal microscopic uh, extra thyroid extension, muscle invasion, which I'll show you, uh, as was mentioned, extensive vascular invasion and positive margins. And the lymph node count from the original surgery was at least 20, uh, 29 out of 65 lymph nodes, as I mentioned, necrosis. Uh, next, please. Um, okay, so here we see um, two, uh, two sections from the thyroid and the circles rec represent microscopic foci of this diffuse PTC. Next, please. Um, and here what I'm showing you is the paraganglioma-like or solid component. Um, the significance of that is that this has been uh, recognized to be associated with the RET-PTC3 rearrangement. It's not, um, it's not a common morphology. It's seen um, more commonly in young people, and it is associated with more aggressive disease. And so you see sort of like Zell ball and just like paraganglioma. Uh, what I'm showing you here is low power uh, on the left and, and high power on the right of muscle invasion at the time of original surgery. And on the left side, you see that pink um, dot in the center, that's necrosis in the primary tumor. And on the right side, you're seeing necrosis on the, uh, in the metastatic tumor. So we would have characterized it at that time as poorly differentiated, PT, uh, poorly differentiated carcinoma arising in PTC based on the tumor necrosis. Great. Um, are there any questions at this point uh, for Dr. Bramwine? 
Uh, just one, Margie, the, there's something called diffuse sclerosing variant, and you right. talked about diffuse infiltrative. Can you, can you right. separate those two for me? Sure. Well, there's actually a couple variants of, of diffuse. There's a diffuse um, um, follicular variant, diffuse uh, classic variant, and then there's diffuse sclerosing. So, um, and so diffuse sclerosing is, is kind of like sclerosing Hosh in the, in the sclerosis and the fibrosis and inflammation. Um, and so that makes the, the, um, the dissection much more difficult. And so th these are diff diffusely infiltrative, um, but not sclerosing. And so the diffuseness is really um, through intrathyroid um, lymphatic channel spread. Gotcha. Um, Dr. Francis, give, give me a little reflection sort of on sort of the big case. You've seen a lot of these younger kids. What, what's different about this kid compared to the if there is any such thing as a typical five or seven year old papillary thyroid cancer care? Well, I think there are several things about this, and uh, it's a very good question. Um, you know, we do see extensive disease in young patients. Um, so at the time of presentation, in patients less than 10 years of age, 75, 80% have lymph node involvement, 20% have pulmonary involvement. So it would be very typical to have metastatic disease to lymph nodes and probably lung given his age and the fact that this was multifocal and bilateral which increases the risks uh, of both of those findings. So I think it's a very um, sad but, but, uh, but common presentation, unfortunately, in this age group. Um, Dr. Langer, can I reflect a little bit about ultrasound in kids? I mean, I know how to use it in adults, but kids always seem to have like a million lymph nodes. Is there, is there any difference when they're doing ultrasound in these young guys? Maybe a little more squiggling of the patient than typically, but no, we're looking for the same findings from in metastatic lymph nodes, cystic change areas of um, increased vascular flow, uh, particularly peripherally because it spreads by lymphatic spread to the nodes. Um, echogenic foci in the node, which could be microcalcifications or colloid, both having the same uh, the same significance of being suspect for metastatic disease. Yeah. Steve Wagespeck, um, there's a, a couple of times Mark said, not only did they have lymph nodes, but there was like soft tissue foci or soft tissue metastasis. How does that sort of typical, not typical for kids? How does that sort of play in how you're thinking here, Steve? Well, I... It's not necessarily typical, but I guess I'm not surprised <laughs> given the, the clinical presentation of this particular patient. Yeah, say a couple uh, more sentences about that, Steve, because I think that's important to think about. Yeah, so, I mean, usually, you know, the, the, the local invasion is more just through, you know, just lots of lymph nodes. You know, it's rare to see true tracheal invasion, which it appears this young man had, although honestly, it would have been great to see a preoperative CT to better understand, you know, what this looked like. Um, so in this case, obviously, this is a very uh, locally invasive tumor that, that really does not respect the confines of any organ it's touching, it seems like. So I don't know if that necessarily makes a difference in how he's going to do, um, uh, because I, I think so, you know, we have to think that his overall prognosis uh, should be similar to someone presenting with less uh, invasive disease. It's just the problem with him, unfortunately, is he's had surgical complications that are really making his case challenging. Agreed. Uh, Dr. Thomas, some reflection on either the use of the, the PET scan in this kid, the radioactive iodine scan, is the REI refractory? It's sort of, how are you thinking about this now? Yeah, well, a couple of comments. Firstly, I'm not, we would always, um, we don't usually use PET particularly um, upfront in most of our thyroid cancer patients. Um, usually the iodine avid may not be that FDG avid. Um, we tend to rely more heavily on our pre-therapy or post-therapy iodine scans. Um, and certainly we would always verify an FDG avid lymph node with an FNA before proceeding to surgery or further therapy. Um, I tend to reserve my iodine therapy for distant disease and try and resect what we can from the neck. Um, so I noted on his... Uh, pre-therapy iodine scan, there was nodal disease in the neck, and I'm not sure whether that was macroscopic or microscopic foci, but if it had been macroscopic, it may have been. Um, I, I suspect we don't treat that disease very well with our iodine, um, and better to chop out what we can and then mop up with the additive iodine. All right, Mark, so uh, so let's, let's see where we are for his current clinical situation and see if we can give you some advice about where to go from here. Yeah, sure. So um, let me let... Uh, 
Jill comment on these images of his neck, of, I'm sorry, of his chest. Uh, this is from June, 2022. Oh, you're on mute, Jill. I am, sorry about that, everyone. What we are seeing are uh, multiple pulmonary nodules, highly sus suspect for pulmonary metastatic disease. Okay, and um, this is a CT scan from that we did in New York uh, from uh, just last week. Um, and then the PET images that you're seeing are uh, now um, eight months old uh, from December uh, last year. Uh, Jill? Yeah, and so here we can see what the yellow arrows are showing us is really multifocal um, tumor deposits. Uh, in the top left, we're seeing one just anterior to the airway plastered right up against it. In the bottom left, we're seeing lateral cervical lymph node metastasis, most likely. In the top right, the blue arrows are show a very important finding of an enhancing lesion in the paraglottic space. And so, as we mentioned before, this would be unusual in that there appears to be tracheal uh, invasion and aggressive tumor here. And in this space, that would very much be of concern that the tumor has invaded through the, the tracheal, uh, through the thyroid cartilage, and therefore is in this particular space. In the bottom right, this is showing the lie of the of the tracheostomy tube, which we can see has sort of an oblique lie and is right up against the wall, which may be relevant to the discussion about tracheal injury and recovery of, of the trachea. And then um, we have the PET scan, uh, which shows uptake in the uh, low central neck, upper mediastinum, sort of a, a high level seven node there. And we have activity in the, uh, the left thyroidectomy bed. Great. Um, Dr. Chen, uh, this is, um, these are images from your biopsy. Yeah, so um, I did a biopsy. I did ultrasound examination for this uh, remarkable young man. And uh, basically what funding is, uh, where I found a multiple, uh, very typical uh, abnormal lymphoma node, and the, including a bilateral central component and a right lateral uh, component, uh, level four and level five. And I did not see the pre lesion under my ultrasound examination. And this could be a technical difficulty there. If the patient come back to New York City, I can do another check. So the, uh, all the biopsy, the only one positive is a uh, left central compartment lesion. And there are actually two there. The one on top is positive. The one deeper is actually a reactive. So this is the FNA biopsy from the cytology specimen. Uh, from the low power point of view, you can see that this is a moderately cellular specimen with a flat sheet of tumor in a clean background. There's really no deposit. The uh, nuclei is still uh, low grade, and this is a high power to show um, a signature feature of papillary cellular carcinoma, which shows us uh, a pseudo nuclear inclusion. And the nuclear eye is still low grade. There's no uh, high grade component or high grade feature here. And uh, there's a, a no really a papillary configuration. So this is consistent with, with original diagnosis, uh, follicular variant or papillary uh, carcinoma. So this is, um, thank you, Dr. Chen. This is the uh, laryngeal exam, uh, say E. Mm -hmm. And deep breath. So there was um, very little, uh, as you can see, uh, very see. little movement. Um, and just uh, for the non-surgeons um, in the group, I thought I'd uh, give uh, some cross-sectional anatomy here to show what we're actually seeing. And so um, this area uh, that's on the left um, CT image at the bottom correlates with this cross-sectional anatomic image. And this is the area that we're referring to as the paraglottic space. Um, and all of this uh, is submucosal I, um, in, uh, involvement here. And the only thing that I can um, hypothesize is that that pretracheal soft tissue um, disease that was identified on pathology at the time of the initial surgery, um, uh, this has to be the route of entry to get into the um, paraglottic space uh, that, um, uh, that's shown here. Sorry about that. So um, this brings us up to uh, that time for us to try to put all of this together um, with uh, 
uh, trying to come to some conclusions and recommendations regarding three different areas. One has to do with this local disease. Um, and this is not biopsy positive, but certainly extremely concerning uh, with respect to that um, those findings in the larynx. And then the lung nodules and trying to comment regarding um, the ultimate goal for this young man related to uh, decannulation. All right, Michael, let me put you on the spot here, Dr. Pittman. Um, what are you thinking about this case? And I mean, what are the options? And I, and I guess the big question is, if you did a surgery, what would be the goal of the surgery? You know, what, what are we trying to accomplish here, Mike? So what are you thinking about this one? Yeah, I think I need like a 30-minute uh, airway board on this kid. But, um, <clears throat> I think there are, are three options for him. Obviously, staying with the trach is the safest option. Uh, not great for playing sports, especially as it gets older. You can't Valsalva and all the other dangers we would assume. Uh, the second option is probably a posterior cricoid expansion with a graft. Uh, and that would give him a good airway and probably get him decannulated. But then the risk of aspiration goes up. Again, you can't Valsalva. I think that's probably his best option. I was hoping until we saw the extent of his disease that um, a bilateral selective re would be the best thing for this kid. And it's a great surgery. I think when the thyroid tumor is more stable and you don't expect that you're gonna to need to go in the neck over and over and over again. Um, you actually take the upper root of the phrenic nerve and re the abductors and then the thyroid branch from the um, hypoglossus and re the adductors. And nearly all these kids get decannulated. They can play, some of them can play sports. There's a kid playing rugby and you get actual vocal fault abduction and adduction and about 70% of the kids and nearly, again, almost all of them are decannulated. So in terms of function, that's probably the best option, but I worry about having to reoperate and then injuring these nerves again, you know, because there's no great way to tag them completely. I think it is something worth thinking about for sure. And then the posterior graft is probably gonna be his best bet because it's, it's stable. Uh, you'll be able to reoperate without worries. Um, a, a regular chordotomy or lateralization will not be enough to allow him to play sports. So those are his three main options. So Mark, is, is this disease um, in this paraglide space fortunate to do something now, or do you watch, or how are you, we'll talk about you know, systemic therapies in a minute, but just focusing on the neck, how are you thinking about that, Mark? Yeah, so my concern in this, Mike, is that we had, the, um, we had cross-sectional imaging from the PET-CT that was done in December. And going through that in fine detail, um, we did not see that disease on that CT scan. So my, the only way I can think about this, and we can't come up with any other explanation for what we're seeing on this most recent CT, I have to assume until it's proven otherwise that that represents a local progression. So you know, fortunately, this would, um, if they, one were to consider dealing with this surgically, which I think is his best option, I don't think he would need a total laryngectomy, uh, but this would require um, an extensive partial laryngeal surgery. And if you, if you did a partial laryngeal surgery, Mark, what would his functional status be afterwards? Because that's kind of a black box for me. Yeah, yeah. So um, normally we can restore voice very effectively. I think given the starting point of bilateral vocal cord paralysis, I think that's going to be very, very difficult for us to get him a functional airway. That's trouble. Dr. Bauer, um, anything we can do from a systemic option? He's got this RET PTC3 kind of solid variant, you know, either as an adjunct to Mark or helping the local stuff out. What are you thinking here, Andy? Yeah, a hard situation. So you know, as the slide already points out, we, we're beginning to get experience using systemic therapy. Um, so there's case reports in the pediatric literature, much of them um, in the multi-tyrosine kinase inhibitors, not that many in the oncogene specific inhibitors, but clinically, um, Stephen and other, and Gary probably and other thyroid centers, pediatric thyroid centers have some experience, you know, on, on handfuls of patients, not on tens of patients and not in any organized um, multi-center study yet, although we're working on it. So I, I think if, if that's accessible by FNA, you know, the paraglottic lesion, um, that would be something to consider. The question would be, 
once we start these therapies, when do you stop them, right? What's the end game? Um, and there is some data to say, you know, they can increase the effectiveness of radioactive iodine, which has not been effective for this patient. So they're not, this patient may not be um, non avid but they're certainly refractory. And so this is a disease that's invading, as Stephen mentioned, non-organ spaces. It's in a place, if that is really a lesion in the paraglottic area that sounds like the surgical options are possible, but not super rewarding for the patient's function. So if it was positive, if, if it's accessible by a biopsy and if it's positive, I would think about it. Um, because how many surgeries can you undergo? This, this particular location, I'm not an ENT surgeon, but um, it doesn't look good if it really is positive. So I don't think we could leave it there, but that would be the question. Is it positive? And then what, what's the best yeah. option after that? Stephen, what are you thinking here for us? Yeah, so, so I think, you know, I like to step back for a second and kind of look at the overarching big picture here. And so I think we have to recognize first that we can't cure this young man of his thyroid cancer. So that's an important discussion to have with his family. So really every intervention that we have needs to palliate something that you know, is gonna cause him trouble. So, uh, so that's important to remember. So in, in my mind, um, I would ask Michael and Mark, would shrinking of any of these lesions facilitate uh, potential for decannulating? Because to me, a goal is to try to get this guy decannulated. And so I'd want to understand what it would take to maybe get him decannulated. And if that um, would involve systemics, and I'd be very willing to offer systemics to try to shrink this tumor and see if it, they can facilitate getting his trach out. Um, I'm not worried. I don't think this guy should ever have any additional neck surgery personally. He's done with surgery or should be. Um, this really is going to be, you know, surgery would be only for palliative purposes. He already has a trach, so I'm not worried about protecting his airway from that um, subglottic um, tumor. And just from an experience standpoint, I can say I've, I have, this reminds me of two patients I've followed over the years. One who presented with, uh, had bilateral vocal cord paralysis, not requiring trach, but had um, um, metastases there. And she was, she did get systemics for a, a couple of years, but subsequently has not been on treatment and is still doing well 15 years uh, later on no systemic. She actually has a track fusion positive uh, thyroid cancer. And then the other, it reminds me, um, has residual tracheal invasion, uh, left paratracheal disease that we have watched over the years without progression. She also has a red fusion. So I, I also understand the natural history in young people is such that this may not cause a lot of badness either. This might stay stable. And probably this disease has been there all along. I'm not sure there was a lot of good cross-sectional imaging in this case um, over the course of, of this young man's care. And as Liz can point out, PET is notoriously poorly sensitive in children with, with uh, thyroid cancer, particularly fusion positive thyroid cancer. So we really don't use PET at all in the population. So the fact that the PET didn't find it doesn't mean it wasn't there. Um, Michael, let me follow up with you. Any, any advantage to you know, a neoadjuvant approach where we shrink this for a bit that would change any of your recommendations or would just make it smaller and not change anything? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, the idea here is what happens over the next six to 12 months with the tumor and the neoadjuvant treatment. And if they can stabilize it, then I probably would think of doing that posterior graft. You know, I think if you do a hemilaryngectomy, I'm not sure you'll ever get this kid decannulated. Um, so because you just there's just not going to be enough room uh, afterwards. And you know, listening to this and thinking about yes, he's going to, it's going to stay. The tumor is going to stay here. If you can stabilize the tumor or shrink it a little bit, I think he's definitely a candidate for that posterior graft. And maybe even over time, you know, if, if it looks, if he responds amazingly well in the next six to 12 months, you could consider the reintervention, which is going to give him the best quality of life for sure. You know, airway wise. Um, yeah. If I could chat, Michael, so the tumor will respond quite dramatically. It's, it's the most likely um, outcome from this. So that, just to let you know, and it should happen within a first, a first several few months of treatment typically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if, if that's the case, and, and you're really not going to go into his neck again, you could consider, you know, the re because they, they're typically done on kids who've had extensive surgery, you know, either congenital uh, bilateral paralysis or extensive surgery, and you're taking nerves that are usually out, relatively outside of the field of the surgery that are probably available and then taking grafts to bring it to the larynx. So 
it's it's still a consideration if the, if the tumor is stable and you're not going you don't think you're gonna be going in the neck a bunch again dr thomas um there's been you know mostly anecdotal but small groups looking at redifferentiation therapies for these kinase inhibitors and red inhibitors obviously much less in kids um is, is that something we should be thinking about here um because i He's not completely REI refractory. I mean, would there be a role if they were going to put him on one of these red inhibitors to do a I-124 PET or I-123 radioactive iodine scan to look at this? I agree with Steve's logic in that you really got to ask what your treatment goals are. Um, and I think we should be aiming to try and decannulate him. And if a period of um, so perhaps need allow some disease control so that surgery can be facilitated, I, I think that's a, a good way to go. I wouldn't be offering him another dose of radioactive iodine at this point. If his um, head and neck um, disease was under control and his lung disease was progressing, then I think maybe that would be a role for looking at increasing the iodine avidity. Um, but again, that's often slowly progressive um, and doesn't cause symptoms. So he's already had two good doses. I think at the moment I'd be sitting on my hands. So Gary, one of the one of the good parts about being old like me and you, you get the final word. Um, give, give, give me sort of the thirty thousand feet, sort of what you're what you're thinking here based on the data we have here, Gary. Well, I appreciate everybody's comments. Um, yeah, I think the important thing to remember with all of these kids who have complex aggressive disease like this is um, what are your goals and what you can realistically accomplish. And so, I think. Um, um, tyrosine kinase inhibition therapy with a goal to shrink this a bit and facilitate surgery and maybe go for the implantation sounds to me like a, a very interesting and provocative option if you can pull that off. Um, I agree. I don't, think, I don't think any additional uh, surgery picking out lymph nodes is going to benefit him in the long run. It's just going to increase his surgical morbidities. Um, and I, I agree, I don't think he right now is a candidate for radioactive iodine. Maybe in the future, um, you know, he's got a, a long way to go. And the natural history of this disease, as Stephen said, is these patients live a long time, despite the fact that they have uh, invasive aggressive disease. So um, he, he may very well in, encounter radioactive iodine again, but I would hope it's many years down the road. He's already had quite a lot, you know, we don't, we don't typically give 150 millicuries to a seven-year-old, but um, he's, he's had a good bit of radioactive iodine already, and um, I, I would not want to push that either. So, Mark, last, last comments or questions from the, for the group on this one before we move on? Yeah, uh, one comment, one question. My comment is I'm certainly glad that you didn't put me into that category of having been around for a long time, um, so thank you. And uh, my second question is really for Steve. And Steve, so the question becomes, um, are, uh, if we go down this path of um, uh, targeted therapy, uh, what would you quote um, to the parents, the risk of disease progression versus stable versus response? On systemic therapy? Correct. So if he follows true to what we see with uh, fusion, red fusion positive papillary, it's going to shrink significantly. Um, and that's just pretty much what we, we have seen. Again, we're still gaining experience uh, with this in adults and, and children. So um, it's almost a guarantee. You know, we don't like to guarantee too much, but, but we will see a clinical response. So um, and then you know, to, to just address Mike's thought. So I think he is REI refractory. Again, we don't have good definitions in children, uh, but you know, he's had distant Mets probably this whole time and it never lit up. And he also had lateral neck disease that never lit up. So I just wanted to point that out. But if he is on a selective red inhibitor, then I think for fun, you could do a diagnostic scan just, just to see. <laughs> that might be something fun to look at, but whether or not you treat him, I'm not sure. Cause again, I would make the main goal seeing if we can decannulate him and stabilize his airway. But what's your endpoint with um, systemic therapy? Uh, you've got a young man now. Is he on that for the rest of his life? Oh, no, no, no. I would suggest short-term treatment up to one to two years. But I would, I would let Michael and you tell me when he's had enough shrinkage to perhaps um, focus on getting him decannulated. Okay. All right. Terrific. Mark, can I make one note that 
you know, if you do try the re-innovation and over the time, if, if it works and over time fails, if there's an injury or whatever, it doesn't necessarily stop you from having the ability to go back and then doing a graft or some, some other surgeries. You don't lose anything. You know, you're not cutting, cutting a bridge in, in terms of trying that. Great. Terrific. Okay. Awesome discussion, everybody. Andy? All right. So we're switching cases at the, oh, so you have my case up. All right. Um, I changed it a little bit, but I'll make it through here. It's actually a nice complimentary case. Um, and there's certain areas that um, are opportunities for discussion, but obviously not as long of a discussion being that we have 19 minutes or whatever Mike <laughs> says that we have before he cuts us off. Uh, but it's a nice compliment. And there are some things that are similar that are not um, some things that we typically use, including PET, um, but it's also part of this as well. So this is a similarly aged patient with similarly advanced disease with a similar fusion, it turns out. Um, this was not planned, it just worked out this way. So presented at the age of six, had lymphadenopathy, had the typical workup for ruling out an etiology, all of that was negative. It, is it easier for me to share my screen? Oh, all right. Um, and so all that was negative and TSH was normal. So that's pretty typical uh, of how metastatic disease presents in pediatric patients. Next slide. Yep, so this was followed by the primary care provider for a period of time with serial exams. And ultimately actually when the patient went to the cardiologist, um, they were um, concerned and suggested that neck ultrasound was performed. So next slide. And this is what we see on ultrasound. So I'll let, I guess, Jill come in because we have the advantage mm -hmm. of having Jill on board. Sure, just, just very briefly, um, as you can see, the gland is enlarged. The parenchyma looks very heterogeneous, but the uh, telltale finding are the multiple echogenic foci throughout the parenchyma, which is this intrathyroidal lymphatic spread, either from dis diffuse sclerosing variant or a lesion that happens to have intrathyroidal spread. And this gets overlooked looked and misdiagnosed as a benign type of diffuse thyroid disease, most commonly chronic lymphocytic thyroiditis, which it can coexist with, not uncommonly. The other important thing that yeah. you had mentioned is examination of the lymph nodes. Almost always these patients will have evidence of metastatic lymph nodes with these echogenic foci in the nodes. Um, and so very important to be able to recognize that and differentiate it from the benign types of diffuse thyroid disease. And that's the bottom of the screen with the peripheral flow, Jill, that you mentioned um, during the previous case. So this patient um, has a complicated past medical history, had a congenital heart disease with a tricuspid anomaly, Epstein's anomaly, multiple large VSDs, um, post-pulmonary artery banding, Glenn and Fontaine. So it had a number of sternotomies actually uh, over her short time, uh, but family history was negative, no predisposition to developing um, thyroid cancer. So the patient was referred to ENT, a biopsy was performed and as suspected, it was positive. It was Bethesda category six. Preoperatively, uh, vocal cord mobility and lengthening were normal um, and the patient was recommended uh, to undergo um, total thyroidectomy central and, and bilateral modified radical neck dissection. Um, at the time, the, the question came up um, and that's kind of a talking point is, what are, whether to perform a sternotomy or not. Um, and that'll come up when we look at the imaging that's coming up. Over that time too, the patient was referred to oncology and somatic oncogene testing was recommended off of the initial sample. Next slide. And that came back as a ret PTC1, not a ret PTC3, but similar ret fusion associated with widely invasive disease. Um, and this was a couple of years ago, um, but we can think about it now in the context of 2022 where there, when there are different treatment options. So next slide, um, patient went to ANC and had actually a, a neck CT um, and a abdominal CT, had a chest CT and abdominal CT, not a neck CT. Um, and the, then the chest CT confirmed what the PET is showing here, which uh, I'll let our nuclear medicine physician comment on, um, but the chest CT also showed uh, miliary, diffuse miliary pulmonary metastasis. Um, abdominal CT showed hepatic congestion, but probably consistent with the congenital heart disease, not related to the thyroid cancer. So this was the PET imaging, which we usually do not get, but was kind of informative. Oh, is there any comment about the PET? 
I'm sorry. Yeah, can you, can you quick client. So this is fairly typical for thyroid cancer and that, you know, they're, they're FDG avid, but intensely FDG avid. So all this abnormal activity um, in, the, in the neck is all nodal activity and you can see it's extending into the media style. And obviously we've only got the mid image here. We don't have any transaxial slices, but that looks like contiguous lymph adenopathy extending right down into the media stylum. No clear evidence of um, skeletal metastatic disease. The micro um, mammillary pulmonary metastases are often too small to resolve on PET um, and are missed. And um, if you are, uh, at my own practice, if I have a high suspicion for pulmonary metastases, so if a child has quite extensive nodal disease in the neck, often we'll do a CT chest, but we don't do the PET CT routinely. So uh, before we go to the pathology, I guess the question that I had, I don't know if Mike had or anyone else had, is do you go after mediastinal disease? This does not come up very often in pediatrics. Um, this was before the patient was seen in our center, um, but they clearly have mediastinal disease. There's no, there's no question about it. So yeah. it's a question. Uh, Stephen, let me put you on there and then we'll do Mark. Uh, for, forget that this young lady had like multiple, had her chest cracked multiple times. If this was a brand new, fresh virgin, you know, nobody had been down there before. What, what do you recommend? Because you, you see these level seven lymph nodes in kids frequently, right? They trail down there. What do you do, Steve? Yeah, so, I, you know, the approach I think has changed. So if you asked me three or four years ago, <laughs> I think we would have been focused on removing what we could safely. And so I think we would have contemplated involving our thoracic surgeons to, to remove what they could. Today, knowing now what we know and having FDA-approved medications that treat what's most commonly, you know, a fusion-positive cancer, I would actually uh, be considering doing upfront somatic testing and maybe a neoadjuvant approach prior to surgery. Um, now, whether or not you'd still go into the chest at the time of surgery, I guess a lot would need to be determined, um, but that, that would be the current thought process. But in general, yes, I think we would consider it, right, <laughs> um, yeah. removing what we could. And Mark, quickly, in 2022, where are you diving down into the chest versus what you can reach with your finger? Yeah, yeah. So in large part, it depends how long your fingers are. Um, so uh, I happen to have very long fingers, and um, you can get quite far down there. Um, so, you know, I think everyone would be extremely apprehensive about um, splitting that sternum again, and um, that, that could be a very treacherous surgery but you can uh, clear out level seven really quite effectively depending on how sticky these nodes are and um, how much scarring there is from the previous treatment. So definitely a good discussion to have and be based on the histology, the somatic mutational status, all of that sort of pieces to the puzzle. Okay, let's go ahead. So the next slide and the one after is the there's three pathology slides to review. Margie, high level view. Can you can we get yeah. a free, free opinion over a computer? Sure, sure, sure. And these happen to be very good pictures. I thought that they were mine, but they're not. Um... <laughs> that's that's why you work with us, Margie. That's awesome. Go ahead. Okay, here we see PTC, um, an intermediate power. We see um, uh, somoma bodies, and it actually looks on the right hand side like there's maybe a Zell ball and type of a appearance here. Okay, next, I think, yes. And so here, it, it actually, I thought maybe it was, was my slide. So again, it looks like a ball of cells. It's not making papillae, although there is a somoma body there, it's not making follicles. So again, that happens to be the paragangliomalike or solid-like um, uh, feature that's seen uh, in this tumor as well as the other tumor. Um, it's not the, it's not the sole feature, but it's, it does speak for PTC, red PTC rearrangement. Okay, next, uh, here we see low power of lymph node, uh, which is positive. And then you see this little green arrow there that's showing you a very definite extranodal extension. So extensive surgery, um, had a sternotomy. Um, 354 lymph nodes were removed, 321 were positive. And as mentioned, uh, extra, I didn't, wasn't mentioned, but extra thyroidal extension and extra nodal extension were present, extensive angioevasion, and unfortunately, three parathyroid glands were. How much, how much do you, yeah, yeah, I'm agreeing, Stephen. How much do you pay your pathologist? Do they, do they? Right, right. Or, no. This, was, this, this, this was before our, this was not at our center. This is prior, <laughs> but that's impressive. I agree. 
Yeah, I, so I wonder, in both I'm, regards, I'm, how many removed, how many were actually counted, right? I'm wondering if that's not a typo, but it, it doesn't look like a typo. No, I, mean, I have the printout and yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> That's, that's good. Probably probably done by Pittman up at Columbia. I don't know what they do up there. All right, Andrew, keep going. <laughs> I next wish. Slide. So six weeks post-op, um, non-stimulated TG was still significantly elevated. Um, patient, unfortunately, has permanent hypoparathyroidism, but thankfully has intact recurrent laryngeal nerves. Next slide. Uh, and received radioactive iodine, a fairly big dose. Again, as we mentioned, actually Again, by chance, 150 millicuries uh, was the ultimate dose. And the stimulated TG at the time, as you can see, rose significantly. Um, this was thyroid hormone withdrawal and two weeks of low iodine diet. Next slide. And this was the scan. Um, so again, if we want to quickly go over the whole body scan. Yep, Elizabeth, comments? Yeah, so it's interesting to reflect on the PET scan, even though we only had the one um, image to look at, but we certainly couldn't see the extent of skeletal disease that's clearly evident on the post therapy scan. And in retrospect, you might be able to go back and see subtle uptake on the PET scan, but it's not unheard of at all to not see things on the FDG PET scan. Um, so these folks are down here in the, the ephemera, um, here in the pelvis, and this focus up here, I believe, is localized to the skull um, after an MRI was done to exclude intracranial metastases. Um, and this Diffuse uptake in the lungs is what we typically see with that miliary type from a metastases. Um, and you can see why you will often miss them um, on a low dose scan because they're just diffuse and you don't have these big lumps or blobs of activity. It's just this diffuse dirtiness throughout the lungs. I don't know where this was localized to, but it, to me, it raises suspicion for a liver metastasis, uh, but it could possibly be um, in bone as well. So widespread stage four disease with, with pulmonary and um, skeletal metastases. So next slide. So patient was followed. Um, this is their summary. This is actually about six months after radioactive iodine. So the TG came down nicely, the non-stimulated TG from 500 to 45. Uh, antibodies mildly positive. Next slide. And this was their treatment. So next slide after. And then was followed with serial chest CT. So this is what happened over the next six months. And then the following slide in a second will show uh, about a year and a half after when we started seeing the patient. Um, and this is what the TG was doing over that time, which was still dropping, but unfortunately the, the antibody titers were increasing. And on serial you know, chest CT, uh, there was evidence of some progression uh, of the pulmonary metastasis both in number and in size of the lesions. But again, the lesions, which are typical in pediatrics were you know, two to three millimeter size, maybe up to four millimeter maximum. And so we were stuck with what to do next. Um, that was when we met the patient um, and trying to figure out where they were as far as their bone mets. We know where they were for their lung mets and what the next best imaging was. And I guess that's up for discussion. So how to how do you follow bone mets, which don't happen very often, thankfully, in pediatrics? Um, do you do bone scans? Do you do a diagnostic whole body scan? Do you do you know, radioactive iodine PET CT? I guess a question for the group, although we don't have too many more, too much time, but at least a short question for the group. Yeah. How do you follow that? Yep. Um, Gary, what do you think? I mean, I, we see bone mets in adults, not so much in kids. How do, how do you sort of do their follow up in terms of lungs? Pretty easy, but bones, how do you do that? Yeah, you know, I really don't have a great answer to that. The kids that I've seen with bony metastasis were many years ago, so it's very uncommon. Yeah. And uh, we just followed them with a whole body scan because that was the technology that we had in the day. Um, so I, I really don't know what the optimal imaging would be. I'd love to hear the group answer. Yeah, we use, we use a combination of CTs. We also use a combination of just plain x-rays, right? The, the x-rays can often tell you if things are at risk for fracture, which is what the orthopedics guys use. So yeah, it ends up flipping back and forth. These guys, it seems like they're every few months getting CTs or PET scans or something. So I'm often getting a look at the bones as part of that. But if I'm worried about something fracturing, it's a lot of times it's plain films uh, to make sure we're structurally stable. So to keep moving forward, um, so there was a diagnostic whole body scan, as you can see there, we didn't ask for new, 
which didn't show the bone activities, but that was not a post-treatment scan, um, so less sensitive. And then we repeated the PET, not that's, that's my usual practice, but there was PET activity on the first, so we decided to use that, another way to look at oh, total body activity, but it was not informative for the bone uh, disease before. Um, and so we are now um, looking at, you know, what the next best options for as far as treatment. So we know we have a patient that's avid, but again, although it's not well defined, but refractory and progressing at least pulmonary wise. So Andy, Andy, anecdotally, we see that Andy. in the diffuse sclerosis that I see are like the late teenagers, 20s and 30s. Um, I'm always disappointed with how well radioactive iodine works. The post-therapy scan is always positive. Everybody's happy. And yet we see progression. So I, I think even those are REI avid. I, I think many times we're not getting adequate lethal dissymmetry. So this pattern over and over in the diffuse sclerosing variant where you, you look great on the post-therapy scans, but diagnostic scans usually negative and still structural progression. This is a pattern we see at least in young adults. Right. So continued surveillance, the neck, actually the PET, which we didn't go over in the last one, still had neck activity. Um, you'd have to go back and you know, look at the ultrasounds and potentially FNA to determine if it was reactive or if it was really you know, persistent PTC or systemic therapy in the next slide. And so in discussion with the family, um, this patient, again, for time-wise, was started on a RET inhibitor. Um, and you can see, as, as Stephen described, um, these medications work wonderfully. Our goal is not to keep patients on it long-term but this is even after five months of, of therapy, you can see just the marked reduction in visible pulmonary metastasis. Um, has tolerated the medicine quite nicely, is growing and tracking um, as far as linear growth and progression and, and side effects, adverse reactions, nothing currently that's concerning. I'm not the treating physician, I'm the partner. We have an oncologist that's helping. <laughs> um, Ted Leach, who's our, our developmental therapeutics expert at CHOP, um, is helping me. Um, so this is a patient that is, you know, doing quite well. And the question now, I think on the last and final slide with two minutes left is, you know, what to do. So as Stephen mentioned, this is not a long-term plan for the patient. We didn't go into it thinking that way. Um, and thinking six, at least a year of treatment and then repeating as was previously suggested, the diagnostic scan, seeing what's there. And if there actually is activity, which we've seen in another patient on larotrectinib after six months, after a year of treatment, that their CT scan was actually um, really nice anatomic response and, and the activity on the diagnostic scan a year after larotrectinib was remarkable as far as still having avid um, uptake. Stephen, let me, let me give you one minute. In, in adults, when we start these kinase inhibitors, they're on them forever, uh, unless they redifferentiate, right? So how are you guys, you keep saying we're gonna use them for a little while, uh, in a minute or so, give me the logic of that and how you guys are <laughs> thinking about that right now. Yeah, so, so we now know that, I mean, we, we've always had evidence, but we know that the, the median disease-specific survival in advanced papillary carcinoma diagnosed in childhood is excellent in over 50 years. So the long-term outcomes are really good. And then just anecdotally, patients that at least I've treated as teenagers with systemic therapies have been able to come off without rebounds like we worry about in, in adults. And I think partly it's just the, the molecular makeup. We don't see TERK promoter mutations. We don't see other you know, acquired mutations that occur in these tumors that make it more aggressive. So yeah, so in children, I think it's, you know, I kind of say it's like a metronomic approach. Like, you know, do you consider treating for a year or two to maximal response? reset the clock and then take them off. And then maybe you have you know, many years of just doing nothing, but we need to prove that. And I think through our, right now, it's just case, individual cases that we could, we could document that. But at least I, I can share some people off of um, larotrectinib that I've treated have not had rapid progression after coming off. So, so I, I think that that is the, the logic behind it. Um, yeah. And it comes up. It comes up even in the adult range. Sometimes we've talked about maybe doing discontinuation studies, right? Maybe they don't really need to be on these for the long time. All right, we're right up against the thing. We got thirty seconds. Mark, you want to finish this out? Uh, I'll say thank you to the panel. Terrific discussion. Mark, take it over there. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mike. Uh, great job uh, navigating through um, all of uh, this material. Thank you to everybody. Um, it's been a remarkable discussion and uh, really informative. Um, and uh, I really appreciate everybody's contributions here. Great job, everybody. And, and, Thanks, everybody. And, Stay well. Bye -bye. Great. Uh, Thanks, everyone. Again next week, we have another 
uh, tumor board scheduled uh, in the adult population. So everybody stay safe and thank you again.